The Lord be with you. Thank you. I think I said it a couple of times, but I'll say it again. Our text is Psalm 1. So, uh, in Psalm 1, we uh, have an image that is given to us uh, about what it looks like to be blessed. And so I brought a picture of a tree that's in my front yard right now. Uh, and uh, clearly, it's summertime. The grass is green and the tree is beautiful and lush. In fact, I think it actually needs a trim there on the bottom. <laughs> Uh, I'll get, get to that. But it's a beautiful imagery of uh, what is commonly used in the Bible to describe uh, the, the life of the believer, the life of the Christian, and that is that it's growing and flourishing. And today as we look at Psalm 1, we're reminded uh, that it's not just about growing and flourishing, but it's about being blessed in fact. And that's, you know, that's how the psalm starts out. Blessed is the man clearly just intended to mean generic, man or woman, but blessed is the man, etc., etc. Now, as I thought about this sermon, I, I uh, wanted to kind of bring those two images together, the flourishing, growing tree, and this idea of blessedness. And so I was thinking about it. I was out at the uh, Principal Classic uh, Thursday, Friday, took some PTO time because inevitably the wonderful folks that work at Principal get me tickets uh, to, go, to go to that uh, golf tournament. And so I was out at Wakanda uh, Golf Club. And so Friday, I just had the $20 ticket to get in. No big deal. I, you know, I'm going to walk around and see the guys playing golf. Uh, but uh, a guy came up to me uh, at the uh, transition from the 14th green to the 15th tee, and he said, are you here by yourself? And I'm thinking, hey, you know, you're not selling me anything here. We're, you know, strange, you know, people approach you like that. And so he pulls out of his, his pocket a uh, Champions Club ticket, and he says, look, if you're here by yourself, why don't, why don't you go use this? Well, a Champions Club ticket is a $250 ticket, and it gets you into where there's free food, and if you can't tell, I like to eat, all right? And so it was cool. I mean, it was great. In fact, out loud what I said is, boy, am I blessed blessed. And I began to think about that question, and I'm going to have Ralph put it on the screen for you. What does it mean to be blessed? And so uh, I, I'm on Facebook, minimally so, but I decided to ask that question of the people that are friends with me on Facebook and got some really interesting answers and uh, ones that I, I now want to share with you. And I presume since they put it on a public site, they, don't ha they knew I was going to do this. So um, uh, they, they don't mind me uh, sharing these things uh, with you. Let me just get to it. Sorry. Okay, here we go. So, um, uh, of course, you have things about family all the time. The first one, dear friends of, of ours, uh, she says that they've been married 19 years and they feel blessed, especially because, as she, she says, it, it's been ups and downs but they've been married 19 years and they, they feel very blessed to have made it through all of those things. Our uh, exec director, Chris Thompson, had a really cool one. He just said, I think of, when I think of blessed, I think of gifts that have been bestowed on me, not things I have earned, of course. And then he says this, that, this was Saturday, so today my family will celebrate the 101st birthday of my grandmother. Isn't that cool, right? To be able to be blessed with a long life for her. You understand the Bible says if you make it to 70, you're doing great. If you make it to 80, you're doing really great. So if you're 21 years past that, right, uh, you're really, really doing great. So praise God for that. Uh, our friend Debbie from Peoria wrote this, I am blessed with a simple and boring life that I thank God for every day, right? And all God's people said amen, right? Uh, um, uh, one of our members here said this, honestly, the biggest trials in my life have brought me the greatest blessings. Uh, very personal, shares this right, right out in public, it's cool. Infertility, miscarriage, health scares, death, divorce of my parents, etc. Each time Jesus pulled me closer to him, uh, and, and she just goes on to, to say how blessed she feels. Um, one of our friends, Beth Howland, who is a uh, we, we have an insanely wonderful and talented preschool director here in Jolyn Yutzi. I would say her partner would be Beth. Beth is an amazing preschool director, and she has bladder cancer. And so she says this, God saw fit to bless me, to bestow mercy on me by giving me still another year of life. All this is enabling me to live in thanksgiving and zest as I share the good news and goes on to talk about sharing the good news with children in the preschool. How cool is it that she thanks God for another year of life to be able to bring Jesus to the kids in the preschool? 
uh, neat stuff. We got grandchildren, <laughs> and this person, again, a member of our church says, grandchildren, and then exclamation point, love like no other. In other words, I don't like my kids as well as I, right, <laughs> as well as I like my, I think that's what I'm reading, reading there, I'm just saying, all right. Um, how, how about this one? This is really heartening. Uh, Nicole says, God chose me to be the mother of an autistic child. At first I was angry, but he's taught me so much over, uh, to overcome, and I have overcome so much. God is amazing, right? For those of us that have special needs kids in our family, we know, you know, at first, man, it's hard. At, at first, it's always hard. But at first, you just go, really? This is just so difficult. But then the blessings, right? They, they, overtake, the, they overtake the difficulties. I know that we experienced that in my family with my sister Beth being Down syndrome. Uh, one of our members who is a widow says this, my biggest challenge in life is my anxiety of being alone, right? When that feeling overwhelms me, I just repeat to myself, you are not alone, you are not alone, God is with me. And then I feel peace. How blessed am I to have a God who loves me so much. Um, let, me, let me just give you one more. This is kind of deep, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. It says this, blessed is knowing that this is not all there is. And she goes on to say, when the husband leaves, when the kids struggle, when a parent doesn't remember who you are anymore, when a loved one goes from seemingly healthy to stage four almost instantly, when the people who, uh, that are supposed to love you the most cause the most pain, when friends turn on you, when you're continually blamed for things that aren't your fault, when the money isn't there, when life just keeps throwing punches, blessed uh, it is uh, knowing that there's so much more waiting for you. And she, she is a... Uh, a righteous Christian lady. She loves God. So I bring all of that to you because I think it's important for us to know that all of those things are accurate, right? All of them are. Uh, the, the Bible talks about blessedness in a lot of ways. In fact, I, I've often said it this way because I'm one of 11 children and I had four children myself. Uh, the, the psalmist writes about children, blessed is the man whose quiver, uh, with arrows, you understand, whose quiver is full right? My, my house was definitely full with four children under five years old, right? Uh, God, God bless my poor wife who sat alone every Sunday with those four kids, all right? So uh, the, the Bible's all over the place. talks about blessedness in a ton of ways, but if I asked you, if I polled you this morning and let you respond, my question is this, would you respond in the way Psalm 1 says it? I don't think so. I don't think most of us would think in those terms, and yet God chose the very first psalm, the very first one of 150, to say, blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, but, uh, I'll just short shrift it, blessed is the man who walks in the counsel of God. So that's where we're headed today. If you want to open your Bible or your device, that'd be great. Uh, we're going to um, just briefly be in Psalm 1, and it'll be on the screen for you. So, well, we're going to be in Psalm 1 the whole time, but as far as looking at the verses, so uh, Ralph, why don't, yeah, give me that Psalm 1 verse. So just a reminder, Psalm 1, 1, uh, how, how it reads, blessed is the man who walks not, you know, this is typical Hebrew uh, thinking, walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. I think you understand the vocables on the screen, but let me just make sure you, you get what, what it's saying is that we got to be careful as believers, particularly, of surrounding ourselves with people that are going to have an influence on us or situations that are going to have an influence on us in a negative way. Uh, my grandmother used to say, garbage in. Yeah, I figured I had a few grandparents in here. Uh, garbage in, garbage out, right? And it's true. Uh, uh, so you could extrapolate that out to the people that you hang with, the influences in your life, not just your circle of influence in the world, but the circle of influence on you, you see. Garbage in, garbage out is really what, what this is saying. Blessed is the man. You will be blessed when you do not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand uh, in, the, in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers, all right? So you know my style. I don't want to just take one passage. I want to give you others to go with this, to bolster this. So I want to take you to, to a couple of them. Let's look first at Pro Proverbs chapter 4. So just a book over, Psalms, Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Now, um, 
as you turn there, let me just remind you, uh, sometimes I say it this way, um, uh, it's an axiom that I live by, knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. Um, what I mean by that, and the, the uh, proverb writer here uses the word instruction rather than knowledge, but you understand the two go together, all right? So no, knowledge or instruction is power. What I mean by that is this. So in today's world, it's really cool. If you're going to go to the doctor, you have some ailments, you're able to look on WebMD and kind of figure out what's going on yourself. Now, I always caution people, and I've talked to doctors about this, don't go tell them what's going on. They are the doctor and we're the patient. But you're able to then convey, right, convey better what is going on with your body in that moment moment. And let's just admit it, all the medical people in the room, the, the patient knows their body better than the doctor or nurse does. It's just true, all right, And in that moment. And so uh, uh, knowledge is power. That's what the proverb writer is getting at here. And what the, what, what is the, I guess the question would be better to say it, what is the knowledge he's getting at? It is, you got to be careful who you hang out with, all right? So again, Proverbs 4, beginning in verse 13, he says this, Keep hold of, there you go, keep hold of instruction, do not let it go, guard her for, for she is your life. He, uh, the proverb writer talks about instruction, talks about knowledge, and then something that is deeper than that, and that's wisdom. So here you go, here, here's all three of those in my opinion. Verse 14, do not enter the path of the wicked and do not walk in the way of the evil. Avoid it and don't go on it. Turn away from it and pass on. Now, let's pause there for a second. What I think needs to happen, notice that he talks about a path or a way. Don't go on that way. Don't, don't walk down there. What I think we need to do is to get in our mind an image. Uh, it could be a painting. It could be like, a, in fact, I'll probably take you to a movie in just a second. Uh, but a scene from a movie that gets you to think of those paths going in that direction as a very negative thing. You don't want to go there, in other words. And, and I hate to say, yesterday when I was driving to church, the image that popped into my mind was the Wizard of Oz, the scene where the flying monkeys come, right? That, that to me, is a way of the wicked. That's a place you don't, you know, the, you got the Wicked Witch of the West, you got the flying monkeys, they're doing all sorts of bad things. And if you haven't seen it, Google it. You can watch it. It's a great movie, all right? It's long, but it's good, all right? So um, uh, think of it in those terms. Or like in terms of, you know, children's stuff where you have a wicked forest that the trees are even alive and are going to come after you. That's what we're talking about here. Walking down that path, I'm not going to go there, Right? If you literally saw those things that are animated, if you literally saw that, then you're not going to walk into that forest. You're not going to walk down that way. You're going to avoid it. If you're, if you're, I, let me, I guess, just say it this way. If your eyes were open to see the reality of the way of the wicked, the way of the evil person, in my estimation, more than likely, you're going to turn away from it, all right? So the proverb writer the proverb writer goes on as to what that means. So uh, he writes this, verse 16, for they cannot sleep unless they have done wrong. They are robbed of sleep unless they have made someone stumble, for they eat the bread of wickedness, and notice their sustenance is the bread of wickedness and um, the, the uh, wine of violence. And as I thought about this, they can't sleep unless they make someone stumble. I, I thought in my brain, the people that are uh, stealing our identities, right, on, on the internet, uh, you almost can't do anything on the internet without putting yourself at risk these days. And for some, it happens repeated. I know our neighbor in Peoria, they were 80 years old. They got hit with this twice, bless their heart. And frankly, they didn't know quite what to do. But notice what's happening. They're staying, you just imagine this dark room, the only, the only light is the glow of the screen. As they seek to, to do violence, they seek to do wickedness because they're not going to sleep unless they're able to do that kind of thing. That's the kind of people we're talking about avoiding. Now, when I was in high school, I, I came back to the church when I was 17 years old. Oh, you've heard my, my story. I'm not going to tell it again. But I came back to the church when I was 17 years old. Prior to that, I was one of the party boys. I was having a good time. 
My, my, my parents weren't watching, so I was doing whatever I wanted to do. In fact, I, I, I don't know if you've heard me say this. I moved out when I was 16. I didn't even live at home. So it's real easy to do whatever you want to do when you're 16 and not living at home, all right? So uh, I tell you that because when I came back to the church uh, at 17 years old, I remember my youth worker who knew my story sitting down with me and saying, Joe, you can't hang out with those guys anymore. At first, I didn't understand the concept, but then I got it. Because every time I hung out with those guys, guess what happened? <laughs> I went right back to the, to the worldly ways that I had before. I had to separate myself. The cool part was your senior pastor is a, a strong leader, and I eventually became a church worker. I went right back to those guys and started, started not partying with them, talking to them about Jesus. But you understand, you got to be careful of the company you keep. Now, as I look out on the uh, room, I don't see a lot of people in junior high, all right, or high school, all right? <laughs> I, I might act like it, <laughs> but all right, you understand, all right? Now, I say that because what is it then for you? What is the sphere of influence, not that you're having, I hope you're having a sphere of influence, but what's the sphere of influence on you? And is it negative, you see? As a Christian person, you gotta take stock of what's garbage in, garbage out. You gotta take stock of what's going into the brain, into the heart, into the life. What are you reading? What are you exposing yourself to? And again, you might just say, Pastor, I'm good. It's, everything's cool. Fine, great. This is just, you know, again, as your pastor, as your shepherd, a challenge to say, be careful what you are allowing to influence your brain. Because it's the same thing as walking in the way of a, a wicked person. All right. So, in order to make a transition, because I need to take you to that second passage in just a second on, that's on the screen right now. Um, we need to remember something, though. So we, we always talk about the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know. And, and you likely know, and if you don't, I'm going to tell you now, that there is also something in theology called a Trinity of evil. So we have the blessed, holy, in fact, holy, holy, holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's also a Trinity of evil. And the Trinity of evil is Satan, the world, and here you go, Christian, my flesh, otherwise known as my sinful human nature, all right? So as a Christian, you understand there's two parts to you. You are sinful human nature and Christ nature. You are the one that wants to follow the ways of the world and Satan, and you are also the one that wants to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And so the, the reason I take you there is we can't just say it's a sphere of influence that is causing these bad things to come into my mind. It's a sphere of influence on me, by the way, uh, that's causing these things to come into my life. It may very well be me, you see. We can't, we can't do it this way. The devil made me do it. Because even Adam and Eve couldn't do that, although they did. Adam and Eve couldn't do that. They succumbed to his enticement. They were all in, James writes about that very thing. The temptation comes when it gives birth to sin. Guess what? It's all on you. You did it. And so we have to admit some onus here. And so I want to take you now then to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Um, and and um, as we read this, I always hesitate to to bring passages like this in the sense that it's easy to look at this list and go, well, my sin's not in there, so I'm cool. You know? uh, this is not a comprehensive list, I guess is what I'm saying. Insert whatever ill is tripping you up as a Christian person, all right? And may maybe it's as simple as gossip. And, and the Bible, by the way, speaks pretty heavily against gossip. Maybe it's something much bigger as you're going to hear me read in just a second. So I'm in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Paul writes this, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? I have to pause. I'm sorry. I have to pause. You're not an unrighteous person. you got to be really careful here. The list I'm about to read, you got to be really careful. Now, if you're living in this stuff, then you may just very well have the, 
the title unrighteous. But if you're a Christian living a repentant lifestyle, and I presume if you're here at 8 o'clock on a Sunday morning, you are, all right? If you're a Christian person living a repentant lifestyle, you are de facto in the eyes of God righteous. So I want to be careful that you don't apply this automatically to yourself. I'm unrighteous. You're not. 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him, you know this passage, I've quoted it a hundred times, God made Jesus, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that in Jesus we might become the, right, yes, right, well done, righteousness of God, you see. So I want to be very careful not to call you out here, unless, I'm just going to say, if you're living an unrepentant lifestyle, then I, I, I need to counsel you to stop and turn around, all right? So, so let's go back to it. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, again, remembering that repentance is in all of these, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor swindlers, nor, insert your stuff here, will inherit the kingdom of God, you understand. And such, here you go, it's past tense, such were some of you, but you were made righteous, in other words, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, in the, and justified just means made right in the sight of God, in the name of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the spirit of our God, all right? So, let me just remind you, sometimes it can be our issue we are intentionally going after things or intentionally living in things that just don't belong in the life of a Christian. And a Christian needs to push those away. A Christian needs to, uh, that, that's why it says walking away on the screen. Be walking away from those on a consistent basis. In fact, I used walking away because it is the ongoing nature of that word. You know, every single day is a pushback from sin and a turning toward God. A pushback from sin, walking away from sin in my life or in the, in the sphere of influence that's influencing me, walking away from sin and walking towards God. I, I simply asked this morning, where are you today? You know, I I, I'm your brother, I'm your, your pastor, but I'm not your Lord. I don't see your heart. You know, God knows where you're at. And I would just encourage you, man, if you're, if you're living an unrepentant lifestyle, please stop. You know, um, uh, Hebrews 10, 26 has some very terse words. Uh, if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. And that doesn't mean sinning deliberately as in I regularly sin because I'm a sinner. It means I don't care what God says, I'm going to do it anyway. No Christian should be there. No Christian should be there. That is saying I love my sin more than I love my God. Okay? All right. So walking away from, right, ongoing action of that, that situation, and then walking towards God, or as I'm going to say it, it's going to come up on the screen, walking with God. Walking with God. Now, I, I, admittedly, I inserted this, but you can, the blessed is the man from the first verse, um, you can do this because that's the insinuation here. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in all these ways. And then you could put it again, blessed is the man, or the woman, of course, who does do this, what? Whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now this isn't, a, this isn't a sermon about the Bible. This isn't a sermon about Bible study, but that is what he's talking about here. Being ingrained in God's word, because God's word is where God communicates to you. Can he speak to you audibly, out loud, in your ear? Absolutely. Does he normally do that? Not normally. For what, it's his decision. It's not mine. He's the boss. What, for whatever reason, he doesn't, but he does speak to you. People say all the time, how am I supposed to know God's will? I say, you got a Bible. Pick it up. Now, it's not going to say Joe Meyer, Mary, Robin, Wellwood. It's not going to say it that way. But the influence is there. Walking in the ways of the Bible, you see, is really what he's saying. 
Now I say it that way, walking with God, walking in the ways of the Bible, for this reason. Because when you're entrenched in God's word, when you're meditating on a day and night, there's a difference in your life. If you are the same day after day after day, then you are not growing like a tree. You are instead withering. You are like a branch that's been separated. You you heard what Jesus said in John 15, separate it out, and what's going to happen? You're going to die. And then Jesus says it this way, those branches that die are only fit for the, I think you know what he means, the burn pile. Okay? So, walking with, what does that look like? I'm going to say it again. Influenced by God's word, influenced by his word in your life, what does it look like? Well, let me give you one last passage. It's Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, if if you listen to my podcast, I brought this in this week uh, because it's just such beautiful language about what a Christian's life looks like in the world. All Again, get get over our bad selves. All the time, I wish, right? But most of the time, you should. That's Christianity. And again, I'm going to say it again. If you've been walking with Jesus for a long time, you ought to be stronger greener, thicker, I'm using the tree image for a second here, greener, thicker than you were. And so I just said, you ought to be thicker than you were last year. Oh, Joe, Joe, Joe. Choose your words carefully, right? Uh, more lush. There we go. That's much better, right, than, than you were last year, all right? So listen to what Paul, Paul writes here. Do not lie to one another. I'm in verse 9, Colossians 3, verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Notice where that comes from. Don't forget, Satan is the father of lies. He's been a liar from the beginning, Jesus says. So doing the lying, in fact, is in league with him. Verse 10, having put on the new self. Notice you go from your your sinful human nature to your Christ nature, both in your bodies. The new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator, Jesus Christ, of course. Here, there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, or free, but Christ is all and in all. And then listen to this list. You almost, reading it, you're almost different. He says this, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, these things, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, Get over it, right? Forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must, it's a command, must also forgive. And above all these things, put on love. That's agape, God's love. Only Christians have God's love. Uh, Agape uh, love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body, and be thankful. Let Here you go. This is the Psalm 1 talk. Let the word of Christ the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing, your, by the way, yourself first, but teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And now listen to this kicker verse at the end. Whatever you do, whatever you do, whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So, so my question for you at the end, of, excuse me, at the end of that reading is this. Do you do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him? Because I'm, I'm, in, I'm going to suggest this to you. That is the Psalm 1 life right there is every single day doing the gut check. How am I living? As an employer, how do I act as a Christian? You know, you may not be able to talk about Jesus at your work, but how do I act as a Christian employer? As an employee, how do I act as a Christian employee? Because of my relationship, my daily walking in the counsel of God instead of the counsel of the wicked, you see. How am I different in my marriage as a husband or a wife. How am I different, by the way? we got to be careful. We always talk about the married life. What about the single person? I have been given this lot in life at this point in time. God's will seems to be this very thing. How do I live differently as a single person and not like everybody else? How do I live differently as a neighbor, as a father, as a mother, as a son, as a daughter, as a friend? 
how do I live differently as a result of this influence that God has brought to me? You just heard what I read. You know what it is. And I'm going to say it again, that's not a comprehensive list. And yet it's a good, well, frankly, it's long enough to start with, right? Start there. And, and hear me say, Christian, submitting to the Holy Spirit in your life, living every day as if it was your last Bringing Jesus Christ to people, not just by telling them, but by showing them Jesus. That's what Psalm 1 is about. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, I'm going to have Ralph put the picture back up on the screen for me. Again, this is in, in my front yard. Now, I have two of these trees, and if you don't know, it's a river birch. I assume most of you knew that already, but um, I, I, I also don't know how many of you know Gary down at, at Hy-Vee's uh, the Lord speaks. <laughs> so uh, Gary down at Hyvie's uh, Garden Center, great guy, man. He just works so hard. It, it's a good thing that there's an off season for that dude because he really works hard. But it was a couple of years ago that I bought these two trees, and uh, I went there at the end of the season because Joe Meyer gets a deal on everything. All right, I can't, I can't stand not to. So there's two of these trees, and they're scraggly, and the leaves are yellowed because they hadn't been watering them. It's hotter than Hades. It's probably August. Uh, and uh, so I, I said to Gary, I said, Gary, you know, you got 150 bucks on both those trees. You, you're kidding, right? Those things look like Charlie Brown Christmas right now, all right? I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, t- I'll take them off your hands. I'll, I'll let you off at the end of the season. I'll give you 75 bucks for both. And he's like, no. Guess what Joe got those two trees for? <laughs> 75 bucks. If he saw them today, he'd charge me 350 bucks, right? Why? Because they've been planted well. In fact, that tree is in the wettest spot in my front yard. They've been planted well, and the guy that owns them is standing right beside them, taking care of them every single day. That's the Christian faith. God has planted you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a Christian. And and so think of it in terms of this. The sermon name is planted by God. Yes, by God, put in the ground. Planted as a tree, a son or a daughter of the King of Kings. But I want to say it a little bit differently. Planted near by God, you see. That's the Christian life. It's a wondrous life. Lived in his word. Lived in his shadow every day. May you be enabled to do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. If you don't mind standing, we're going to sing.